Welcome to IT Audit Webinar Training via Practical Application presented jointly by AuditNet and Richard Cascarino and Associates. This webinar is part of the AuditNet Training Without Travel series covering IT audit. My name is Jim Kaplan. I'm founder and owner of AuditNet and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Joining us is Richard Cascarino, Principal of Richard Cascarino and Associates, who will cover this two-hour webinar. Let me have Richard introduce you, himself and give you a brief overview of his background, and then I'll cover the housekeeping items for the webinar. Richard? Thanks, Jim. Um, welcome to the webinar. As Jim said, my name is Richard Cascarino. Um, and for those of you who are here for the full series, you've got me for the next 10 webinars, or five if you're doing the first series only. I'm a principal of Richard Cascreen and Associates based out of Colorado in the States and out of Johannesburg in South Africa. At the moment I'm broadcasting to you from Johannesburg. Um, at the moment we have clear blue skies here and sunshine so we would not anticipate any disruptions to transmission. There's always a possibility of a problem if you get thunderstorms. My background, I've got a depressing number of years experience in IT. IT audit, IT audit training and consultancy. I am a past president of the Institute of Internal Auditors here in South Africa. I'm also a member of ASACA, a member of the ACFE. I'm on the author of, um, at the moment, three books. You can see them on the screen. Auditor's Guide to IT Auditing, Internal Auditing and Integrated Approach, and Corporate Fraud and Internal Control, a Framework for Prevention. Okay, that's my background. Um, just to give you some webinar housekeeping, I'll hand you back to Jim. Thanks, Richard. Well, you should have received these slides this morning, so I'm not going to go into detail and read them. But basically, we are recording the webinar, and you will be able to view that recording uh, after, after the webinar is over. We'll try to get that uploaded within the same day if we can, but you will get a notification the following day uh, with the link to the recording. Uh, because we are operating under NASBA rules and issuing NASBA CPE, we are required to ask polling questions during the webinar, and you will receive CPE certificates if you answer all of the polling questions. You must be in attendance for the full uh, full time today and then we will uh, we will send you your polling questions if you're joining us from a mobile device or a uh, an iPad or any sort of uh, device like that uh, you may be able to participate in today's webinar but you may not be able to answer the polling questions please uh, accumulate the answers in a single email and send them to us and we will record your answers in our records. Uh, you will receive the CPE certificates and the link to the recording uh, to the email address that you registered with in GoToWebinar, so it's important that you provided a correct email address. You can ask questions during the webinar, just submit your questions via the chat box on the screen and we will monitor them and answer them as uh, as appropriate. Usually we try to answer them during the uh, the breaks for the polling questions. After the webinar is over, <laughs> You will have an opportunity to provide uh, feedback via a survey. Uh, please complete the feedback uh, questionnaire and help us improve our webinars. Uh, the next screen provides you with information about our disclaimers. Again, I'm not going to read that in order to allow Richard the maximum amount of time for today's webinar. So at this point, let me turn the floor back to Richard. Richard? Thanks, Jim. Well, welcome to the webinar. This is what we're going to be covering today. I have no idea overall what your background is in IT and IT audit. So what we're going to do is we're going to take it from square one. We'll not take too long about it, looking at technology and audit, and looking at the roles of control objectives and risks. We'll have a look at the basics of systems, batch systems and online systems. Um, there's a tendency to ignore batch systems because everything appears to be online real-time these days. But in actual fact, behind many of our systems there is a batch component which needs to be controlled adequately as well. We'll take a look at programming computers. For those of you who have done no programming, 
this will just give you a background to how computers are programmed, how pro programs are written, who does what, and how do you know that 2 plus 2 does in fact equal 4, always and forever. There's an old saying that when you're dealing with accountants and auditors and IT people, they've got a kind of different background. So if you ask a mathematician what is 2 plus 2 equal, he will tell you 4. If you ask an accountant what does 2 plus 2 equal, he will ask you, well, what would you like it to equal? I can make provisions. But if you ask an IT person what is 2 plus 2 equal, they will tell you anything I tell the computer that 2 plus 2 equals. If I program it that 2 plus 2 equals 3.8, 3.8 it will be from now forever. So you need to understand some of the vulnerabilities brought on by the fact that computers themselves have to be programmed. We'll take a look at database systems. Most of the application systems that you'll be looking at will be database based, um, but there are different types of databases with different control fundamentals and different opportunities for auditors. We'll have a look at computer risks and exposures. We'll take a look at computer security. We'll have a look at application systems and the development and the controls around the overall operations of computers. And then we'll wrap up by having a look at your questions and then we'll end the webinar. Okay, so kicking off some key concepts now these are standard audit concepts. We talk in terms of examining the records in order to provide reasonable assurance. We look for acceptable levels of risk. We look at levels of materiality. If I am a programmer and I go to my boss and say, remember that program you asked me to write? Here it is. I can give you reasonable assurance that it will probably work. He's going to say, you mean it doesn't work? IT works in binary, on, off. Yes or no. It works or it does not work. When they hear auditors talking in our jargon, when we talk about examining the application systems to get reasonable assurance, they don't know what we're talking about. So you need to understand their jargon and where they're coming from. We talked about acceptable levels, with levels of materiality. There's no such thing as a level of materiality in IT. It's either right or it's wrong. Not it's right most of the time. So we'll take a look around with those in mind, those key concepts in mind. We'll take a look at some of the control environments and at the primary elements of internal control because they establish the conditions under which all of our internal controls will operate. We can have segregation of duties. It's a normal business control. But you cannot enforce in the computer that which does not exist in the business. So if you only have one person entering transactions, authorizing transactions, reconciling transactions, then it doesn't matter how many times you've got to sign in and out with different user IDs and passwords, you cannot have division of duties if you've only got one person. I went to, uh, to do some work for a company in the gold mining industry and we had a young lady, Betty, now what her job was, was to process the proceeds from sales of gold. So she would get the transactions coming through, she would enter them into the computer, they were sent to the bank, the bank would then action them, and away it went. The way it was set up, Betty would look at the handwritten transactions, and she would enter them into the computer. Now all Betty was allowed to do was enter. She did not have the authority to authorize. 
So when Betty had finished entering, she would log off the computer. She then logged on to the computer with the supervisor's password and authorized all of the transactions that she'd entered. She then logged off. At three o'clock in the afternoon, she logged in with the third password and transmitted all of these transactions to the bank. The bank sent back an independent fax to a fax machine. So the organization would then have an hour to remove any transactions, otherwise it would all be sent off. The fax machine sat at the side of Betty so that she could check that what she put in was what came through in the fax. In actual fact, there was no control in there whatsoever. That organization was processing 300 million bucks worth of transactions a day. The bank accounts had not been reconciled for six months. I went to see the head of finance, explained the position, he threw up his hands in horror and said, don't worry about it, I'll make sure that Betty does an end of day reconciliation every day from now on. And we're not kind of missing the point here. Your organizational structure is not giving you any control. Our control framework, who is allowed to do what, on whose authority? You've all got user IDs and passwords and access rights into computers. The question is, who gave you those access rights? Now normally it's your boss who will fill in an appropriate form and send it through to IT. Does IT know who your boss is? Does IT know what his signature looks like? Does IT have any way of verifying that your boss is authorized to authorize you to do these things? If they're doing it electronically, you have the potential for more control. But once again, it's only a potential. As long as the your boss says to his number two, give that person access, and the number two says to his secretary, give that person access, use my user ID, you don't have a control framework. And the control framework is dictated by the organizational policies and procedures of the organization. When you have a manager who says, I trust my staff, everyone should be able to go everywhere and do anything, then you have problems. There will also be external influences. There are external entities who have access into your computer systems. There's the engineers, if something goes wrong. There's the software suppliers, there's the hardware suppliers. There's also government. And if you're operating within the cloud, there are the cloud software suppliers, the cloud structure suppliers, and of course, the communication suppliers, all of whom are going to have an influence on the internal controls that as auditors, we come along and say, that looks okay. We can rely on that. So, what are these individual things? The control environment, our organizational structure will define individual management's responsibilities and authorities. And that's where we have the appropriate segregation of duties, or not. If managers have overlapping responsibilities, then it doesn't matter what you do inside the box. You don't have the raw material in order to enforce segregation of duties because it's not designed to happen in the business. A control framework will depend on the nature of the organization that we're dealing with. A large organization tends to have highly structured control frameworks. Everything has to be written in triplicate. Everything has to be in writing. We have to have proof. In small organizations, they tend 
to use personal contact between employees. So things are done by word of mouth. They are done by an SMS or by an email. And the emails may or may not be retained. Within that, in a large organization, it's fairly straightforward to ensure segregation of duties. In a small organization, much more difficult. You may not, in fact, within the computer, be able to enforce segregation of duties if you've only got that one person. What you can have instead is supervisory overview, even if it is retrospectively. We have the competence and the integrity of our people. Do your people know what they're doing? Do they know why they're doing it? And are they willing to continue to do that? The obvious one is passwords. If you ask people, why do you have a password? The most common answer you get is, don't know. Um, couldn't tell you. It just comes up and says, enter password. So I type in Fred. Oh, I wasn't supposed to tell you Fred. However, however, having said that, if we've got that kind of ignorance about it, then don't be surprised when people share passwords. And don't be surprised when people don't change the password. The question I usually ask um, in an interactive session is how many of you changed your password recently? And typically every hand will go up. Next question, how often do you change your password? And the common answer is every 30 days. Why every 30 days? Because the computer makes me change it every 30 days. If the computer did not make you change it, would you change it anyway? Oh yes, because we are auditors, we understand risk. So from that perspective, when you're looking at it, let me throw another question. When was the last time you changed the PIN number on your ATM card? And that's your money. So if you're not willing to protect your PIN number and your money, why should the company believe that you're prepared to protect their money? We need to ensure that the people who are exercising the control understand why they're exercising the control and what the implications are if they don't do it correctly. They need to have the appropriate levels of authority. They need to be held accountable. And they need to have adequate resources in order to exercise the appropriate controls with the appropriate supervision and review. Generally, the overall control framework will describe what's being done, what are the functions to be done within that business area, what interrelationships are there with other departments, what external influences, are there any laws which apply, are there any regulations, are there any company policies and procedures that fit in this area? Are there any customs, the way that we normally do things in our industry is different to everybody else? Are there any agreements with unions? What are your competitors doing? So that whole thing is typically laid out in a control framework. And that's got nothing to do with IT. That's part of the company as a whole, or it should be. The policies and procedures will define the scope of the function, whether it's the IT function, internal audit, purchasing, sales, whatever it happens to be. The scope, the activities, the internet, interrelations with other departments, etc. So all of that has to go together 
to give you the basis for which we will then put in our systems. And our systems come in two forms. Our manual systems and our automated systems. And again, there's a temptation for internal auditors to look at the, the automated systems and ignore the manual systems. We'll put them aside just now, the manual systems, and we'll look at our automated ones, but we will come back to the manual systems because you cannot ignore them. Systems within computers take two forms. We have our system software and our application software. System software carries out what I tend to refer to as non-user functions. Okay? It runs the computer, it runs the hardware, it does the processing, it will get records from the disk, it will write them back to the disk, it will operate the computer, it will handle your telecommunications, okay? and it will handle the management of your data. Now all of these things you have to do just to get the computer to run. But the application software is the bit that does the business function, whatever that business function is. So it's the programs that were written either in-house or if you bought a package by someone else in order to run your general ledger, do your order processing. I tend to use payroll as an example because every company has to pay people. So we have our application software and when we go in as auditors, not IT specific auditors, but auditors, we tend to look at business functions. We look at the accounts function. We look at the human resources function. We look at order processing. We look at the warehouse. So we tend to look at the application software but we have to recognize that any application software running in the computer will run under the control of the, app, the system software. Everything runs under the control of the operating system. Even if you're running a big mainframe and you're running a security package, you're running BRAC-F on a big IBM, the security package runs under the control of the operating system. So if I can get the operating system to think that my program is part of itself, I can bypass potentially your security software. There are ways around these things. As far as our manual and automated systems are concerned, we also have to concern ourselves with end user systems. These are systems in the olden days, it tended to be a package that the user had bought, but not necessarily to run on a PC, but not necessarily. It could be a package that was developed by the end user to meet their own specific needs because they're not prepared to wait for IT, they're not prepared to pay the charge out for IT, they want direct control over it, whatever. Danger with end user systems is it took IT many, many years to learn risks and control objectives and controls to meet those control objectives to run on the computer. Now the user develops their own systems, they have no backups, they have no division of duties, they have no access control, they just developed a system and why should I have all these things? It's running on my PC, it's running on my notebook, it's running on my tablet. I don't need to worry about these things because it's only me until something goes wrong. So what kind of control procedures do we as auditors look for? Once again, there are specific and there are general. General IT controls include controls over the operations of the computer, the physical security, logical security. Program change control can be a critical area. Once we've got this computer program written, we've tested it, 
it works, it does what we want, how do you make sure that unauthorized changes are not made to that program? Because if anyone and his grandfather can change it, then I could have a real problem. And I wouldn't necessarily know about it. As far as the application systems are concerned, we also have controls over the application systems themselves. Now the application controls tend, as I said before, to be oriented towards the business, whatever that business is, but all of them have the same general control objectives, accuracy, accuracy of processing, 2 plus 2 must equal 4, or whatever we decide it must equal. Completeness, everything that goes into the computer must be fully and accurately processed, and not just disappear into the network somewhere and it must be authorized. We can classify our controls, and we can classify them into three basic areas. There are other classifications that you can use, but generally we work at preventative controls, detective controls, corrective controls. Preventive, preventative, things that are supposed to prevent an undesirable event. And that includes things like restrictions on users to stop them getting into areas they're not supposed to, to stop them from doing things they're not supposed to. Requirements for passwords. Passwords are a much maligned control, and quite rightly much maligned. Um, it's the, one of the primary controls that we rely on, and once again, if you ask people why you've got a password, they may tell you, that lets me into the computer and they're wrong. They may tell you that keeps other people out of the computer and they're wrong. The thing that lets the computer and the person into the computer is a user profile. The thing that keeps other people out is the fact that they don't have a user profile on this computer. All the password does, if it works, is it authenticates to the computer that you are who you claim to be. Now, if you can get that message across to users, then I may be entitled as a user to sign checks. You are entitled to sign checks, but you're not entitled to sign checks with my name. You want to sign checks, you sign it with your own name. If you can get that message across, that removes the threat of people sharing passwords. It makes sure that people start to guard the password, in the same way as they wouldn't leave blank signed checks lying around. The use of separate authorization is a preventative control to stop one person having access to do all these different things. Detective controls will detect undesirable events after the fact. Things like effective use of audit trails, now you'll notice the key phrase, effective use of audit trails. There's lots of systems that have got audit trails that nobody ever looks at. The whole purpose of having an audit trail is for someone to follow that audit trail. Personally, I don't like the name audit trails because that tends to suggest that the only people that use them is auditors. A more accurate one would be management trails. The idea is that if something happens in the computer, that the manager can follow the trail back to see where the, the originating transaction came from. Or if a transaction goes into the computer, the manager can follow the audit trail through to see what resulted from that transaction. So it's actually a management trail, not an audit trail. Auditors will use them to check that the things that management is expecting to happen are in fact happening. Exception reports, again a detective control. It tells you when something has gone wrong. And there's absolutely no point in knowing that something has gone wrong unless somebody does something about it. 
in my early days in computers, I had a user. I wrote a system for whiskey manufacture, for costing out blends of whiskey. The system went live, and two weeks later, I got a phone call from one of the users saying, your system is rubbish. Pardon? It's missing casks of whiskey. How do you mean? Well, some of them aren't there. Well, did they all go down? Yeah, they all went into the computer. Okay, I'll come down and have a look at it. So I went downstairs, and I had a look at the transactions that had gone through, and right enough, some of them were missing. I said, did any of these come out on the error report? What error report? I said, Alan, you get an error report every morning that you're supposed to scrutinize. I never get any error reports. I said, you get them every morning. Never seen one. Okay, let me go and get today's. So I went upstairs, went to the computer and said, could you rerun today's error report? Took it down and said, there's your error report. All oh, those things. Yes, I get those every day. And what do you do with them? Oh, I file them over there. But what do you do about the errors? What do you mean, what do I do about them? I said, Alan, it says, look, it says there, rejected wrong cask number. That means you've got to look it up, find out why it's the wrong cask number, and fix it, and put it back in. Oh. I didn't know I was supposed to do that. So, exception reports, Detective controls, useless unless you have a corrective control that says when something goes wrong, this is how to fix it, this is who is responsible, and then they actually go ahead and do it. And that includes things like disaster recovery plans, the ability to reverse transactions if something goes wrong. These are all corrective control. You can also classify them into discretionary and non-discretionary. Discretionary controls is up to the human being. We can talk in terms of we will have supervisory review of authorization of transactions. Yes, if the supervisor does it. Non-discretionary controls are provided by the system and cannot be overridden. Things like the use of PIN numbers when you go to an ATM. You cannot override that. Well, actually, it can be overridden. We did have a situation where a guy walked up to an ATM, put his card in, and keyed in the alarm code for his house by mistake, and it paid him the money. And he said, that can't be right. I've, not, I've keyed in the wrong PIN number. So he put it back in again, keyed in a random PIN number, and it paid him out. And he went into the branch and said, this is what happened. The branch manager said, that cannot happen. Would you try it? So he tried it. It happened again. They called IT. IT said, that is impossible. We'll send someone down. So they sent someone down, tried it. Same thing happened. Tried a different ATM. The same thing happened. What had actually happened was there had been an update to the software. And there was an error in the software. And what a junior programmer had done was he went to fix the software, and while he was fixing it, he switched off the PIN number checking in every single ATM in the banking network. And nobody knew. And he did it on his own authority because he thought, who's going to notice? Well, somebody noticed. But non-discretionary should not be capable of being overridden. We can also classify them into things like voluntary or mandated. Voluntary is designed, it's a control designed by the organization to support whatever it's trying to achieve. Mandatory, you have no choice. This is the law, you will comply. Manual versus automated, we've talked in terms of. Application versus general IS. Application controls to do with whatever that particular business application is. General IS to do with the running of the information systems function. There are also control objectives that we can look at. And we can have 
potential risks within the organization, things like fraud, IT fraud, major problem, business interruption, it could be a denial of service attack or it could simply be that you've got no power. We had uh, an interesting situation um, last week. Now, last Friday was in South Africa when people get paid. One of the big banks' computer systems went down. The mainframe went down. None of the tellers could operate. None of the ATMs were working. People were going in to draw out the payroll to pay all of the workers. They couldn't get the money. People who were paid electronically were trying to draw out money on the ATM. They couldn't get any money. There was hell to pay. And that was just one of the banks. Business interruption. Errors. Customer dissatisfaction. I'll guarantee that they have lost a substantial number of customers since they opened because of the poor public image that that has created for that particular bank. And it's one of the biggest over here. Inefficient and ineffective use of resources. Now those are all to do with the general control objectives covering potential risks. A lot of auditors get confused when we talk about control objectives. What is a control objective? Roughly speaking, what is it you're trying to stop going wrong? What are you trying to achieve? That's your control objective. The possibility of it happening is the risk. So general control objectives would include things like integrity of our information, Security, compliance with policies, plans, procedures, rules and regulations, maintaining the integrity of the information overall. So that if it's right, it stays right. If we look at the transaction data and transaction objectives, when we start off, we put things in. There are only three things you do in any computer system. It doesn't matter how fancy it is. You put things in. You churn it around, you take things out. That's it. Whether you're putting in transactions and taking out checks at the end, negotiable documents, whether you're putting in um, graphics, and loading it up onto your own web space or your own blog or whatever, you're putting things in, you're manipulating them inside the box, and at some point, someone's taking it out. So when it goes in, we need to ensure, as a control objective, all transactions are initially and completely recorded into the computer. As an auditor, I want to see evidence that there are controls that are operating on a daily basis, on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, to ensure that that's happening. All transactions are completely and accurately entered into the system after they've been recorded and all transactions are entered once and once only. As auditors, we can be looking for controls to achieve that, including things like the use of pre-numbered documents. So if a purchase order goes missing, we can see immediately. Control total reconciliations, data validation, logging activities, scanning documents in. One of the most common problems that we've got is still the use of the keyboard because people make mistakes, they have finger trouble. With voice recognition, you get the same thing. You have problems with that. With document scanning, you can also have things go wrong. So a one can be scanned as a seven, or a B can be scanned as an eight. Depends on how good the person's writing is, and how good the scanning software is, and how good the scanner is. Access authorization, document cancellation, document cancellation simply where you stamp it saying entered so that it doesn't go in twice. As far as the processing is concerned, our major objectives 
are to ensure that approved transactions get accepted by the system and processed, they don't get rejected incorrectly. Anything that's correctly rejected gets reported, corrected and goes back in again. All of the transactions that do go in and are accepted get processed once and once only. They're all accurately processed, they're all completely processed. Nothing disappears somewhere in the mix. Controls in this area would include things like the use of control totals, program balancing, brought forward plus transactions equals carry forward, segregation of duties, restricting access, use of file labels. Now I'm not talking about going and sticking a, a label on a disk, I'm talking about the file label on a file that has been created, saying this file was created on that date from that program by that transaction um, at that time under this user ID and cannot be overridden until this date if necessary. Those can go on electronic labels on the files so that when the next time that that file is used you can be sure that it's last week's that you're picking up to update and not three months ago. We can have exception reports telling us what's going wrong, error logs telling us what has gone wrong. We can use reasonableness tests. It is unreasonable to have negative inventory. So if a transaction is going to put your inventory into negative, there's something wrong. Concurrent update control, so that we don't have two users sitting at two terminals concurrently updating the same record. How many are in stock? Five. Okay, I'll take three. I'll take three as well. Net effect is either you end up with minus six, uh, sorry, minus one, or you end up recording that there are still two in stock, having just given out six. Because you permitted users to access data concurrently. As far as our data and transactions are concerned, we also have our output controls. Now outputs come in different forms again, hard copy output, file output, online inquiry files including screen images etc. Primary objective in this case, control objective is assurance that what is coming out is the result of what went in and what happened to what went in. So input and processing is what's going out and that the output is available only to authorised personnel. Typical controls in this area include the use of a complete audit trail or use of our output distribution logs. And that is critical to make sure that the integrity of our programs and processing continues. So we need our change control to make sure that nobody can inadvertently or deliberately make unwanted changes to ensure that adequacy in des design and development controls so that when a change is made it is properly tested before it goes in and to make sure that transfer from the test environment into your live environment works in a controlled manner. If you don't do that then you end up with a system that cannot be maintained because nobody knows what it's supposed to be doing right now. As far as controls in this area are concerned, we look at systems development and we have got typical controls including things like the use of a formal systems development lifecycle, user involvement, adequate documentation, formalizing a testing plan. Don't worry about the SDLC, we'll come back to that. Planned conversion. There's a feeling that you turn around and say, okay, we've developed a system, we've tested the system, we'll throw a switch and we're live. It doesn't work that way. You're going to have to take what used to happen, whether it was clerical, whether it was a manual system, whether it was an old computer system, and convert it to the new system. Convert the data 
And it could be that the reason you're putting the new system in place is because the old system didn't work properly. So your data is basically rubbish. Now you can take that rubbish and load it in to the computer, into your new system. And you're starting off your new system with rubbish. So in the conversion, you may have to clean up as you go. We need to use post-implementation reviews. Major control. It's the main Establish. Major control objectives of our data communication. I'm getting some feedback here with someone else. I don't know if someone is unmuted. It's just disappeared. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Establishing quality assurance function and critical for us, involvement of audit. Whether you're using your own in-house internal auditors or whether you're bringing in external consultants to fulfill that role. And that brings us to polling question number one. And I'll hand you back to Jim. Controlling, I'll try that again, polling question number one, major control objectives over data conversion would include, and they're all there, take your pick. Once again, you don't have to get these right but you do have to answer them. Okay. They're not trying to find out whether you have absorbed everything that you've heard. What they're simply asking is, did you hear anything? They're almost finished. Just a couple of people to come in and we'll close the poll. Once again, if you cannot, if you're running from a tablet, don't forget to take a note of what your answer will be and then send it in to Jim on an email. I'll close the poll and share the results. And you can see most people have gone for all of the above. Okay. Now, what are we looking at? We're looking at data communications. And the answer would be all of the above. Okay. But if it was specifically only the communications part, then the correct answer would be C. The access is available only to authorized users. Okay. Meanwhile, I said about those objectives, control objectives, over the years those change. Now primary control objectives don't change, we're still looking at the need for accuracy and completeness, but in the early days we only had batches of information, where all input was collected centrally, and input together in a batch. In the old days, it used to be a punch card. It doesn't have to be a punch card. It can still be a batch system where, for example, information can be gathered from online meters for electrical usage, gathered together into one batch and then processed all together. Okay, now, it could be entered via a terminal, gathered, in this case, a smart meter would be a terminal with update taking place in batch mode. But regardless, we're still concerned with completeness of transactions and the accuracy of transactions. Nowadays, typically you've got online real-time input, but there's still in most systems a small batch component, and you ignore that at your peril. So what do we mean by online real-time? Input via some kind of terminal with instantaneous update. You can have online data capture with batch update or real-time, which says when I press that button, the transaction takes place instantaneously. 
in many systems, you'll find that reports are produced overnight on a batch basis. Terminals themselves could be local, which means they're under your control, or remote, in which case you don't necessarily know who is using it for what. So you better have some way of authenticating both the terminal to make sure it is one that you know about, and the person using it to make sure that they are authorized to do those things from that terminal. Terminals can be dial-up or dedicated. When I say dial-up, I include coming in via the internet. And again, there can be differing types of terminal. We tend to think of terminals as a screen and a keyboard. But these days, if you take your car in for a service, they plug your car into a computer, and your car is a terminal to that computer. Primary control objectives for real-time systems include availability, confidentiality, security, accuracy. Communications. Communications comes in all kinds of forms. It comes in microwave communication, satellite communication, as well as dedicated cables, dial-up communication. If you're using cable communications, you can have your line operations digital to analog. Now, you don't often find that anymore. Most communications are digital. But occasionally, you'll find that you're going through, if you're dealing internationally, you're going through a switchboard, which is an analog switchboard, and you're still back to using modems. Modem takes an analog signal, converts it to a digital signal, so it modulates it, and at the other end, it demodulates it from, from analog back to digital. Regardless of whether you're using digital or analog, it can be simplex, in other words, one-way transmission only. So I send the signal round the network, and then it comes back to me or half duplex, it can either go from me to you or from you to me, but only one at a time. Or full duplex, where we can have two-way communications. Half duplex is a bit like CB radio. You press the button to send, nobody can re transmit until you release that button. And of course, these days we have the ubiquitous wireless communication, which is everywhere. Synchronous, you'll come across the, this jargon when you're dealing with, with IT people. Synchronous and asynchronous communication. Synchronous involves high-speed transmission reception of long groups of characters. Here is the start, here is the string, there's the end, did you get it all? Asynchronous communication is slow, is more or less gone out of habit these days, but you will still encounter it occasionally. Irregular transmissions, typically one character at a time with start and stop bits. Here's a character, there's the character, that's the end of the character, did you get it? Here's the next character. Okay. Encryption. Most transactions these days use some form of encryption. Encryption involves scrambling the data into an unreadable form in such a way that it can be unscrambled at the other end. And that's a critical one for encryption. There's no point in encrypting it such that it cannot be decrypted. Protocols are simply a set of rules for message transmission through the network. So if you've got um, TCP IP, then you're using IP internet protocol. That's the internet set of rules for message transmission. As far as networks are concerned, there are all kinds of networks that we can look at. We've got public switch networks, that's the typical telephone system. Value added networks, where someone is adding a component in using some kind of data concentrator or computer to add value to simply broadcasting over a wire. We get local area networks and wide area networks. Local area networks used to be within 100 yards. 
Nowadays you can get very big local area networks. Wide area networks are, as it explains, wide. I am here, you are there. We are on a wide area network. The backbone that we're using for our wide area network happens to be the internet. But it doesn't have to be. And of course, we've also got the cloud. The cloud is everywhere these days. And everything exists in the cloud. Network configurations, again, depends on the organization that you're looking at as an auditor. Different structures of, of networks can have different control concerns and therefore require different control opportunities. Point to point, where we've got a separate direct link. This is physically connected to that. Multi-drop, very common. Multiple terminals sharing a single line. Now, if it's point to point, I send, you receive. The only thing I need to worry about is someone eavesdropping on that line. Multi-drop, I don't send to you, I broadcast down the line is going to you, but anyone else connected to that line could also read it, could potentially delete it, could potentially change it. Ring network, where the transmission goes from my computer to another computer to another computer to another computer to you. There is no central computer. Each machine is a node on the network. And once again, that at each of those nodes is potential for that message to be intercepted, to be read, to be monitored, to be changed, to be deleted. Now encryption will stop anyone seeing the contents of the message. It will not stop someone interrupting the message. And it will not stop someone recording it and duplicating it. So we get this concept that when we're dealing with networks, encryption is everything. It's not. It's a very powerful tool, very powerful control, but it's not everything. Star networks, these are the earlier networks, but you still find them, where you have one central computer and everyone connects through that computer. So it is the hub. It coordinates all communications. If I want to speak to you, my communication goes into the hub and back out to you. You reply, it goes into the hub and back out to me. Nice thing about it, it gives you a central point where you can control. Disadvantage, if that hub gets overloaded or goes down, your whole network's out. Nice thing about star networks too, they are cheap. Cloud. I mentioned different configurations that you can get in the cloud with different um, control requirements. You can have things like infrastructure as a service. So I don't want my own computer, I will rent time on somebody else's. Platform as a service. Application and software as a service. So in each one of those, it's a different type of cloud with different control concerns and different ways of handling it. For our online systems, we've got online service capabilities. Online inquiry allows a remote user to retrieve data directly. Under that, our primary concern is confidentiality. Do we know who's looking at this? Are they entitled to look at it? Is anyone else eavesdropping on them? Online data entry allowing remote entry of data, and it can allow concurrent processing of data. So we can have multiple users all processing at once. Primary concern, is this transaction authentic? Is it coming from a known user who is authorized to process this transaction? Is it accurate? Is it complete? Online Services with online update, the same as online data entry, but with immediate effect. Primary concerns are all of the online entry ones, plus concurrency control and availability. If that's not available, your whole system may be down, effectively. So basic online concerns, 
we worry about availability of our systems. Are they up? Are they available? Are they able to put power into the hands of the user? Security, we concerned about unauthorized access, accidental or intentional changes. And our security threatened areas could be our operating system itself, whether it's Windows or whether it's um, an i-series or whether you're running a big IBM mainframe, whatever you're running, that operating system we worry about. The management features built into that operating system. We worry about who can access them, what can they do, is anyone monitoring? Intercomputer communication, dial-up access, gateways, poor performance, all of these are concerns when we're dealing with our online systems. As far as availability is concerned, we're worried about the hardware components, but also the software, the data, the networking capability. My computer might be working beautifully, but if I cannot connect, I've got problems. My computer might be working beautifully, I may be able to connect, but my staff have gone on strike, I've got problems. So availability, of all of those components. Human beings are a component of a computer system. So how do we ensure that availability? We ensure by an adequate physical environment. So as an auditor, we're going to check the physical environment to make sure that things should not go wrong. I did have one client um, in South Africa who in a three month period got hit by an earthquake, a flood and a tornado and managed to survive. Adequate backups, multiple redundancies, one of anything is not enough. One backup isn't enough, one data communication line isn't enough, one person who knows how the system works is not enough. Peer-to-peer -peer networking, so that I've got two computers. If that computer goes down, I can run it on this computer and adequate training. So as an auditor, if, my, if I'm auditing, looking for that control objective of availability, I'm looking for evidence that management has got all of those things covered. Security, a function of hardware, software and human beings. Hardware will worry about theft of hardware and it's become incredibly easy these days to steal tablets, laptops, but we have had situations of theft of mainframes. I had one client in South Africa where they came in on the Monday morning and the mainframe was gone. And they went to the security department and said, where's the computer? They said, the men took it away on Saturday. What men? The men with the truck. What truck? The truck to put the computer in to take it away. Look, we've got a signature. You're dealing with human beings. Theft can happen, sabotage can happen, and even penetration of the hardware can happen. As far as operating system software is concerned, possibly one of the most pirated pieces of software is Windows. But again, it doesn't have to be Windows. There was one large organization um, in a government area where they had a problem with what appeared to be a virus and they called in the manufacturer. The manufacturer had a look at it, found the virus, it was a virus, fixed it and sent them a bill for three and a half million dollars. What, 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 what are you doing? They said, you have a network of 90 mainframe computers and all of them are running pirate software. Our software, here is the bill for the software. So it can happen even in the biggest companies. Corrupting the software, bypassing the operating system software. I've seen users who turn around and tell you, my computer, my desktop, my notebook is 100% covered. My operating system is locked down tight. I'm using a version of Windows with encryption and everything else. And that's great until you open the diskette, oh, sorry, the, the disk drive, and put in a disk with 
Linux in it. One of the other operating systems. Reboot the machine with Linux, and all of a sudden, all the controls that were built into Windows have gone. So you may or may not have security afterwards. Application software, again, we worry about theft of application software. Companies have spent millions developing their unique application software for their unique applications. Someone steals it and takes it to the competitors. It happens, believe me. Corruption of application software. We picked up a fraud in one uh, government department, again, where every single programmer had their own version of a program that went into the payroll and paid them whatever they wanted that month. Bypassing the application software. Having a copy that does something slightly differently. So that when it comes to that part in the run, it doesn't do the normal one. It jumps out and does something else. Substituting one program for another. As far as data is concerned, theft of data, corruption of data, Substitution of data. Looking at my pay on the payroll and saying, I don't like that. Five, make it a nine. Zap. Manipulation of data. All of these are possible. All of these are areas where we need appropriate security. So where do the risks come from? Well, they come from the insiders. Our standard users. They come from our specialists, our IT division, our auditors. They come from outside users who are legitimate users. I went into one client and they had a problem with the computer. Two files were out of sync, they were out of balance. I said, what do you normally do now? Oh, we call our supplier. Uh-huh, and what do they do? They do a force balance. I said, what's a force balance? I don't know, but they do it. What do you mean you don't know? Well, they, they log in, and when they're finished, it balances. But which one is correct? Oh, we don't know. They'll know. So I contacted the supplier and said, this force balancing thing. I said, you've got file A and file B. They're out of balance. Which one is correct? We don't know. I said, well, how the hell do you balance it? Well... If it's an even day, we make B balance to A. And if it's an odd day, we make A balance to B. It works out in the end. So these are legitimate outsiders with access straight into your live data, potentially lethal. Then, of course, you've got the outsiders who are not legitimate access, not legitimate users, the hackers of this world. And there's plenty of those around. And that brings us to polling question number two. And once again, I'll have to hand it back to Jim to run polling question number two. But you can see it there. Data conversion activities would include all of the following except acquisition of data, identification of sources, development of conversion programs, developing the new application system. And I'll give you a clue. This time it's not all of the above. We have 90% have voted. Uh, there we go, 96%. As soon as we get everyone voting, we will go ahead and close the poll, and Richard will be able to continue. OK, we will close the poll in another 10 seconds. If you have not voted, please vote now. 
And we will go ahead and close the poll. Share the results. And it looks like the majority said all of the above, Richard. And in fact, that is correct for that question. I'm looking at a different question on my one. Um, I've got a different answer for, for uh, the last one, which was developing the new application system, which would be wrong. But the question that you were asking or were answering was would include all, would include what? And the answer would be all of the above. Okay. I'll go ahead and hide the poll. <clears throat> Turn it back to you. Thank you. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever written a computer program, but we're going to take a look at how we program computers. We'll take a look at the programming languages, who programs them, the SDLC itself, change control, and problem management, because those can get mixed up. For those of you who've already done some programming, you may wish to fall asleep, or you may not. You're welcome to continue listening. Programming. Many, many, many years ago, when I first started in computers, my first program was written in binary. Now, computers come in two forms, binary computers and analog computers. Analog computers tend to be computers that do things like run power stations, run nuclear reactors, etc., run processes. Binary computers are computers that process transactions. And the conventional computer that you're going to come across in most of your work will be a binary computer. And the problem is that binary computers work in binary. And that's it. End of story. Within the computer, they have memory. And the memory is either zero or one. Nothing else. So if you write a program, you write one zero zero one zero one 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 zero one zero, etc. In the days when I started, they estimated that to write a program and get it working would take a good programmer about two years. You think about it. You've written this program. It runs into 20,000 ones and zeros, and one of them is wrong. Question, which one? So it took forever to write, but they were very, very fast, comparatively. To try and speed up the process, we moved to symbolic codes. Symbolic codes were the assemblers of this world, where you could say things like pack rate to rate one, load hours to hours one, move character to a word mark from region four, four characters, etc. And that was then interpreted into 1001010, but you didn't have to write it. Then we moved into the third generation languages. We got things like Fortran. Fortran was a formula translator. So everything was written in the form of a formula. So here is my formula for pay. Regional pay equals rates times hours. Call the tax calculation. Deductions equals WIT. TX plus UF plus insurance plus pension, etc. Then we saw the advent of other languages. We had things like Clio, we had things like COBOL. There's a typical COBOL statement net pay calc routine multiply rate by hours worked giving normal pay. It's English like statements. Okay. And then we moved on from that into a whole range of programming languages. We had um, the ADAs of this world. We had SQL. String of them out there. In the future, where are we going? Well, we've already got fourth generation languages. We're seeing fifth generation languages start to come in in fairly common usage. We're also starting to see the advent of no language, where everything is built in hardwired into the machine with the adjunct of artificial intelligence. But how do you write a program? Well, the programmer sits down and in whichever programming language writes what he wants the computer to do. That is the source code. 
in whatever language that they have chosen. That now needs to get translated into the 1001010 for the computer. So we run it through a compiler or an assembler to create something called object code, which looks like binary code. And it now has to be link edited into all of the individual parts of the computer to make it executable. And the executable code is 10011010. And we do that in three different ways. We can either put it through a compiler, if it's a third or later language. We put it through an assembler, if it's a second generation language. Or we put it through an interpreter. Now an interpreter is interactive. Okay, So it goes line by line by line through the source code and converts that line executes. Next line executes. Next line executes. It's slow because you're not running the computer using executable code, you're running it using interpretive code. But it's flexible. Problem. The source code has to be available. And that means the source code can be changed. So if you are running very commonly on, let's say on a laptop computer, and you are using um, basic programming language, or using Pascal, or using any of the languages that you can run on a computer, and it is running interpretively, i.e. you don't have a compiler because you didn't buy that, then you have to worry that someone could get to that source code and change it, someone who is not you. Now, how do we get the program? Well, first and foremost, we look at doing an analysis. So we look at the business and say, what do we want this system to do? Then we design the business specification for the system. The outline system specification says, I will want from a terminal to be able to do the following things. Based on that, we'll then go through a second design phase to come up with a detailed design that says, in terms of computers, I will need a program that will look like this and it will do the following things. It will need to access this data in the form of these files. So I've now got a detailed specification that says exactly what I want this computer system to do at a technical level. Then all we have to do is write the coding and test it and retest it because it didn't work and retest it again because it still didn't work. And if necessary, go back and redesign part of it to try and get it to work and retest it again until eventually we think this thing is working. Then we can run it and from now on we audit it. Now we could audit the development process. How did we develop that system? We could audit the system as it's being developed to make sure that the business controls are being designed in, coded in, tested to make sure that they work. Or we could audit the thing after it has been developed to make sure that the controls that were designed and built in continue to work. So the SDLC Systems Development Lifecycle is a process used to control the generation of programmed systems. And the idea, it doesn't matter which package that you buy, which SDLC, how many manuals it comes with, the objective is the same, to produce a quality system as specified by the user, on time, within budget. And the preliminary phases doesn't matter, once again, which version you're using, they follow these. Okay, Feasibility study, to say, wouldn't it be a good idea to develop a new system to do the following? Let's do a cost analysis. Yep, it's cost effective. If we get these objectives, if it does these things, it will be a good idea. Let's go ahead. Now, we've done that before we've actually designed what we want to do. So we actually don't know how much it's going to cost. 
so we don't actually know if it's feasible or not. We know if it's possible, but not if it's desirable. We'll do our outline design, we'll do our detailed system design, we'll do the coding, test, implement, and post-implementation review. Now you can find some new development methodologies that bypass all of that and go straight to from outline design into code. Let's put it together and look at it on the screen. I don't like that, let's change that bit. I don't like this, let's change that bit. It can be very fast to implement, but the danger is that you implement what you want the system to do. Okay, now, that sounds as though that's what you should be implementing, what you want the system to do. The problem is that 90% of programs are not of the, the coding of the program is not to handle make it do what I want it to do, it's to handle stop it from doing what I don't want it to do. So I want to program the computer to pick up a mouse. Now it's very easy, I can write coding that says go across to the mouse, pick it up. But the first question is, is there a mouse there? If no, go and do something else. If yes, is it within reach? If yes, fine. If no, move within reach. If you're within reach, is it to the left of me? No. Is it in front of me? No. Is it to the right of me? No. Is it behind me? Yes. Turn round. So all of these question and answers are handling error conditions. And the danger when you get into some of the accelerated techniques is that you design it to pick up the mouse, you don't necessarily design it to handle the error situations. So that's the SDLC. Problems with the SDLC, getting hold of the user staff, because this is their system getting hold of the right level of staff. I need to speak to the manager. Well, actually, no, I don't. I don't want to speak to the manager. I want to speak to his number two, because the number two is typically the person who actually does the job. And that's who I need to speak to when I'm designing my new system. Technology lust. Technology lust says, we can't do it the old way, it's old fashioned. Yes, but it still works. It doesn't matter, it's old fashioned. We've got to go for the latest technology. Even if it's expensive, even if we don't know how to do it, let's go for the latest technology. We get overextended timescales. We have inexperienced staff. They may be excellent programmers, but have they ever programmed a financial system? Do they know what they're doing? And I've seen well-written programs that were actually breaking the law because financially the system didn't work. We can have timescale problems where we've got too long between milestones. The longer it goes for a project, key staff will change, business objectives will change, the costs will escalate, and it may well be that before you finish the system, the hardware and software may become obsolete. I had one client who was brought in at the tail end of a project. They'd spent 18 years and 20 million bucks developing an online, real-time, relational database, fourth generation, petty cash system. By the time they were three quarters way through the process, you could buy a package to run on a PC that would do exactly the same thing cost $200. But we've started, so we'll finish. They carried on and finished the whole project. Then they scrapped it. Conversion activities include the acquisition of data, identification of the sources of data, developing those conversion programs. It's a major task and it requires strict control. You can have developed the most wonderful system under the sun. You bought a superb package. Rubbish in, rubbish out. 
And if audit isn't involved anywhere else, you need to be involved at this stage. Not doing it, you are not quality assurance, but to make sure that somebody is monitoring those things. Somebody is controlling conversion activities. Get it wrong, and if the system doesn't work, you're going to end up with erroneous management decisions, unacceptable accounting policies, inaccurate record keeping, business interruption. The Lord protect us from built-in fraud. It's a danger within systems development that somebody designs in, codes in, programs in a fraud, tests it to make sure it works. All of the wonderful things Violation of legal statute, breaking the law, inflexible running conditions, inflexible operating costs, overrun budgets and unfulfilled objectives. Why? Because we didn't look at the whole thing before we started. Incomplete economic evaluation, whoops. Management abdication, leaving it to someone else. And I must apologize, the poll question related to the content slide conversion was asked before it was delivered, it was put in the wrong order. My fault, my apology. I'm looking for the audience who got it. All of these things cause problems with no project kill points, temptations to computer abuse and incoherent directions. Overall, our project management is like any other project. We need agreed schedules, schedule review, assigning work to people, monitoring performance, monitoring progress, status reporting, all of these standard project controls you would see in an engineering project, we need in an IT project. And we also need our change control. Change control, the objective to make sure that when a change is made, we control risk, not introduce it. So our objectives, are all changes authorized? Are all authorized changes properly made? Are only authorized changes made? Are all of the changes as they were originally specified? And were the changes worth doing in the first place? Not our control objectives as auditors, management's control objectives. Our requirement, check it. I have a question from Jim for controlling polling question number three. We're not at polling question number three yet, Jim. Don't worry about it. I'll fire it off when we get to it. Apparently I can you see polling question number three. Okay, apparently you closed it. Yeah. I don't know if we'll be able to launch it again. Um should be able to. Let me just check. Closed. You may be right. Do you have ac do you have access to the polling questions now, Richard? No, only the ones that have run. It's a it's a problem that we've got with um, for the people who are on the screen. It's a problem that we've got with go to webinar. It's a new version, and I cannot actually see the <laughs> polling questions. So Jim's firing them off, and that one just unfortunately went too early. It okay. comes in at the end of this database one. All right, I'll have to reload it. Sorry about that. 
I will talk slowly so that you get the opportunity to. Thanks, Jim. So let's take a look at databases. Databases are critical because whatever programs we write, we're going to be accessing data. So what is a database? Database, generically, is a collection of data. That makes sense. Logically organized. What does that mean? To meet the information requirements of a universe of users. Now we're getting confused. In the old days, when you wrote a program, you would use a file. So you would have the payroll file. And you would have the personnel file. And you would have the pensions file. But the problem is that the payroll number and name appeared in all three files. Well, that was a bit of a waste of time. So why not have it in one big area and put it in such a way that different users can use different bits of it? And that was the concept behind the database. A collection of data organized somehow to meet the information requirements of all of the users. And the DBMS was a hardware and software system that manages that, di that data for you, the database management system. Now, it could be IDMS, it could be DB2, it could be Oracle. There's a variety out there, different types of DBMS, but they all do the same thing. It's a software, in most cases, if you're running iSeries, it's a hardware software system that manages that data by providing that organization and by facilitating the access to the data and the control functions over who can go where and do what. Data dictionary, you'll hear that term thrown around, and data directory system is a software package or part of the DBMS that manages essentially the yellow pages about your data, where it is, how to get to it within that database environment. Okay, the data dictionary tells you what it looks like. The data directory tells you where it is and how to get to it. Typically, they're combined into a DDDS. Okay, database administration is a human being involved in the coordination and control of the data-related activities. Now, they are not normally interested in the contents of the data. They are interested purely in how it is being achieved. We've got user system interfaces. These are the components within your database environment that allows a user program written in whatever programming language that you choose to request information, manipulate it, transform it, and send it back to the computer. Data structures define the interrelationships of data, and we'll take a look at those. Storage structures or how that information is physically represented on a disk somewhere. Okay. Access methods, the software procedures used to get in there, retrieve the information, modify it, delete it if necessary, write it back. So, different types of database. In the early days, we had sequential databases. You probably will not see many of those around. Hierarchical databases came next, and they followed the typical business hierarchy. Very fast, excellent for high-speed number crunching, but not very flexible. To get over that, they introduced the concept of network databases, where everything was joined to everything else with chains and pointers and links and connections, and that became a tremendous overhead on the machine to maintain all of these links and pointers. So they came up with the concept of the relational model, which says we will split our data into small data sets with a relationship between them. And we don't need to define it in advance. We will define the relationship when we use it. So I can say I want the name from the employee file and the department name from the department file where the employee number on the employee file equals the employee number 
on the department file or the department number on the employee file equals the department number on the department file. So there'll be something in there where there is a relationship and it's usually equality. This information on that file equals that information on that file. So I don't have to hold that department name on every single employee's record. Components within these will have a data definition language that the DBA will use, a storage structure definition language, a data manip manipulation language, and a database management system nucleus and utilities. Okay. Some of these can be of use to the auditor. Some of the DBMS utilities can actually work as a very the effective computer-assisted audit technique. If we look at the different approaches, the sequential approach, the fundamental assumption is that there is a direct relationship between data. There is an employee number associated with that employee name. That employee name associates with that employee number. Okay, so a direct relationship. Hierarchical approach says there's some hierarchical relationship. So the employee number is related to the name and the pay and the deductions. The pay has pay for January, pay for February. Deductions have deductions for January, deductions for February. And we can go up and down the chains. Jargon that you'll come across there will be things like root segment. The employee number here is the root segment. These are, or the employee pay is a parent segment with children down here and you can have twins. Problem, if I want to see all of the information for that employee for January, I'm going to have to go in at the employee number, go to the name, get that, go to the employee pay, go to the employee pay details for January, then I've got to go back up through the chain and go across to the deductions and come down to the deductions for January. I cannot cross the chains. I cannot go from January pay to January deductions. I've got to go up and down those linkages. So that was a bit of a pain. So we came up with the concept of the network approach. And the network approach, the assumption was there was some general relationship between the data. So pay for January, pay for February. I can link pay for January to deductions for January. And there'll be a pointer from that one to that one. Instead of going pay for January, back up to employee, down to February, back up down to March, back up, down to, you know, I can go across them. Give me January, then February, then give me next, give me prior. Jargon you'll come across there are records with pointers and you can define any structure and records can contain multiple fields. But the more linkages you put in, the slower the machine's going to go. The relational model, we have that fundamental assumption that there is some mathematical relationship between the data. So there's my employee table. In relational databases, you don't have record, you don't have files, you've got tables. And you don't have records, you've got table entries or tuples. Okay. It's the same thing, but we call it differently. Because you don't make money by calling calling it the same name. You could invent something with a new name. So there's my employee neighbor with, table with employee number one. It's employee number 15. Department number 43 is F blogs. Department number 47, employee number 25 is J Smith. On the department table, department 43 is internal audit. Department 47 is IT. So to use that, at the time that I'm using it, I would say I want the employee name and the employee number from employee table plus the department number, uh, sorry, department number perhaps and the, certainly department name from the department table where the department number in the employee table equals the department number in the department table. And that's done when the program is executing. So you don't have to maintain all of these chains and pointers. The DBA, the functions of the DBA include coordinating the information content of the database, deciding the storage structure and access strategy, liaison with the users, defining the authorization checks and validation procedures, strategies for backup. In other words, handling the day-to-day -day running 
of the database. And they've got a whole pile of utilities to load the data into the database, to reorganize it, to do statistical analysis to say that path is never used, get rid of it. It's an overhead we don't need. Recovery, they will handle recovery if something goes wrong using the data dictionary, using different database analyzers. For database recovery, typically when something goes wrong, if you've inserted or replaced or deleted something and it failed, when a database operation fails, when a transaction fails, you can get something called deadlock, where you've got two tables. This one's locked because I'm updating it. That one's locked because someone else is, is updating it. I want to access theirs. They want to access mine. Nobody can go anywhere, and the whole thing grinds to a halt. So under those circumstances, the DBA will set up recovery procedures. From system failure, it should be automatic recovery. From media failure, the Lord help us. If you get a head crash on the disk and everything on the disk is wiped out, we have to go back to last night's disk and recover it. What are we trying to recover? Bring it back to a known state to minimize the work that's been lost and allow recovery on a transaction by transaction basis quickly. The idea is to remove the manual work that has to go to recapture all of these transactions, to make sure that recovery data is safe and that transactions have been lost to inform the users the last transaction which worked was that one where you need to re-enter. So what control tools do they have? Well, they've got the recovery log, which is a way of backing out. A checkpoint. A checkpoint is a point in the processing during the day when nothing is moving on the database. For a split second, everything's okay. So mark it. At that point, everything's okay. We only need to go back that far. We don't need to go back to last night's. If we do need to go back to last night because there's been a major crash, we've got the database dump that we did last night, and we'll have recovery and restart software that will allow us to progress from there. Our recovery logs, two basic logs, before and after images. Okay, before this transaction occurred. It looked okay then, everything was fine, here is the date of the program, here's the next program to modify with the transaction, bang, before anything happens. Then we process the transaction, then we record what does it look like now. And that's applied at point in time to back out faulty update transactions. So if it crashes, we can back out all the transactions to the last checkpoint when everything was okay. After images contain the image after modification and we use that if we have to go back to last night's to bring the database forward in time to the last checkpoint or the point of failure. Okay, so when all activity is terminated, everything in memory has been committed to disk, buffers are flushed, all transactions are queued now until we mark this checkpoint. Then we'll allow the transactions to continue. Checkpoints can be taken at any time. Operating system itself will take checkpoints. You can do it within the application program. You can say every 5,000 transactions, freeze everything, mark a checkpoint. Based on elapsed time, based on number of transactions processed, based on the value of transactions processed. And that brings us to our third polling question. And now we have the primary role of the after image is to back up false transactions, bring the database forward to the point of failure, reprocess transactions on a transaction by transaction basis, Establish the most recent checkpoint or all of the above. Now this is the after image, after the transaction has happened.
We have 88%, 94% voted, 96%, 98%. We'll leave it open for another 10 seconds. And we will close the polls now. Share the results. 43% said to establish the most recent checkpoint. Okay, remember what the after image does. The after image says, if something has gone wrong, I can go back to the previous checkpoint and roll forward from there. So it's to bring the database forward to the point of failure or to the most recent checkpoint. It doesn't self-establish a checkpoint. It brings you up to that part when everything was okay. Okay, don't worry about databases. We'll come to them later in the series in a lot more detail. So let's take a look at computer security. What is computer security? Well, it's been defined as security around and within the computer, the associated equipment, and the people using it. Okay, so it's everything and all things. FIPS Publication 102 defines computer security as the quality exhibited by a computer system that embodies its protection against internal failure, human error, attacks, natural catastrophe that might cause, etc. And that includes attempts at an unauthorized access and the use of data processing for unauthorized purposes. Critical one in there is that one, human error, because that's the one that's normally ignored. So what is included in computer security. Physical security, to make sure people don't steal your computer. Personnel security. Data security. Application software, system software, telecommunication security. All of these. We worry about computer operation security, vital record retention. Hang on one second. EDP insurance, outside contract services, DRPs and computer crime and fraud. All of that comes within the scope of security. And we can audit security as such. Some myths on security, that computer security is a technical problem. It's not. There may be a partially technical solution, but it's a business problem. Security breakdowns happen to other firms. They don't. They happen to you, believe me. The major threat is the data processing staff. No, it's not. The major threat is outsiders. No, it's not. The major threat is your everyday users who press the wrong button accidentally or deliberately. Only a computer wizard can perpetrate computer fraud. I think you're not muted, Jim. Hi. Yeah, why don't you do that and then uh, Jim, that way you're not I should be able to finish up the webinar. I'm sorry. Okay, bye. bye. Jim, you're not muted. You're broadcasting. Thank you. Okay. So security myths. As I said, only a computer wizard can perpetrate a fraud. Not true. Anyone. And it's usually low-level staff who know where the problems are. And we know because we ask them. Computer security is physical security. It's not. It's partially physical. It's also logical, and it's not my problem. It's a myth. It is your problem. It's everybody's problem if you want to continue working for the company. So how do we control security? Procedural controls, workplace and controls. We've talked about some of these, communication security, encryption, authentication of messages so you know for a fact who it came from, reconciliations, making sure they happen. And that brings us to Polling question number four.
Polling question number four, IT security incorporates all of the following. Or which of the following? I think everyone's twigged on that one. Once again, you don't have to get it right, you just have to get it. We have 96% voted. Shall I close the poll? Okay. I'll close the poll and share the results. And as you can see, we were almost 100% on all of the above, because it can be any and all of the above. Okay, what about operations? Their job, to respond to equipment failure, to handle things when things go wrong, to produce backup copies as they are informed to, as they're instructed to, to restore from backup when authorised. It's not their decision to make. When they're authorised to do it, then they can do it. And handling the famous unpredictable conditions, because sooner or later something will happen that nobody thought about, and it's operations who are going to have to sort it out. Their job on a day-to-day -day basis, they'll handling mounting and dismounting data files, loading paper, aligning special forms, setting up job runs, if it's Tuesday at 5 o'clock it must be the payroll, loading the programs, balancing run priorities because there will be multiple programs all trying to print at once, all trying to access data files at once and it's up to operations to set, to balance things out, to maintain an even flow. They will respond to operating system prompts if the operating system says give me the number of the next file then you can carry on. Responding to application system prompts, same thing. Maintaining incident logs and performing routine housekeeping tasks. That's all the job of operations. They look after the file and program languages, uh, sorry, libraries, online or offline libraries. They handle remote site libraries with program source code being held off site and they'll handle it when the um, object code is held off site for security purposes, for backup purposes. A lot of organizations these days will have automated uh, library functions but again we need segregation of duties. Operators are running the machine, it's not their job to fix data files when things go wrong. It's not their job to fix programs when things go wrong. So they will handle all of those things. We need the appropriate segregation of duties. Output distribution, they handle the dispatch of hard copies, controlling print spool files, network printers, even to the extent of shredding confidential scrap. There's a lot that comes out of the computer on printouts that the user never sees. It's got the user codes and it's got passwords printed sometimes. All of that is confidential. All of it has to be scrapped. Operations typically handle the scrapping. Things that can go wrong at the operating level. Number one, human error. Human error in data entry, human error in console entry, using the wrong copies of files, using old versions of programs. Simply dropping a disk pack can cause untold damage. But we also get the standard stuff, hardware failure, software failure, computer abuse. And there's an old saying, to err is human, to really foul it up, you need a computer. So when we talk computer disasters, we mean disasters. 
Controls within the operations include run controls, predefined run schedules. If it's a Tuesday, we process the payroll. If it's five o'clock, we run the invoices. Use of log files, computer logs, and manual logs and someone scrutinizing those logs to make sure that what was supposed to happen, happened. System performance statistics, budgetary control, supervision, all of these. As far as operation controls are concerned, we need to ensure that IT cannot initiate transactions, systems and programming are independent from operations, programmers don't operate the machine, All of these controls that you can read there, all of these are under the auspices of operations. Operations staff need to be rotated. Operations staff have to take holidays. These are all controls that we would expect to see within our operations. And that brings us to our final polling question. The filing polling, final polling question, IT operation controls include We have 94% voted. And I'll close it and share the results. And as you can see, 94% voted, 87% went for all of the above. They're all operation controls or operation control objectives. So overall, what are we trying to achieve? We are trying to achieve IT control. We're trying to control to achieve IT effectiveness, IT efficiency, and from our perspective, IT auditability. Remember, whenever someone says to audit, or oh, it's not at a stage for audit to be involved. We're developing a new system, but we need you to come in afterwards. Remember always this, you as an auditor, as a secondary user of every single computer system that's out there. Okay, The primary user of payroll is the pay department. The primary user of your inventory is your warehouse, but you are a secondary user because at some point you're going to have to come and audit that system. So you need to ensure that the controls that audit needs are built in there, the audit trail that audit will look at has been built in and will work. And that brings us to the end of this webinar. Are there any questions? Don't be shy. Jim unfortunately had to go, so you're stuck with me. But remember, if a question occurs to you after this, you can always email it through. You'll get uh, Jim's email address and mine at the end of this. You can always en email it through and say, what did you mean when you say that? What's coming up next? Next is, next, is on Thursday, where we're looking at auditing database structures. I told you we'd get back into it again. Then we're looking at uh, the audit use of CATS, auditing contingency planning, and then IT fraud and countermeasures. Then we move on to the advanced one, which is auditing IT risk analysis for auditors, IT audit, looking at securing the internet, 
IT security reviews, performance auditing of the IT function and wrapping up by looking at um, managing the IT audit function, which is on May the 28th.